Hey everyone, Keenan Gray here from DieStat.com, bringing you another edition of DieStat Discussions. The Collegiate season starts this week, and a big one down in Stillwater, Oklahoma, the Cowboy Preview. And of course, the man to talk about that Cowboy Preview is none other than the head coach of the Oklahoma State Cowboys and Cowgirls, Dave Smith. He joins us here on DieStat Discussions. Dave, it's a privilege to have you on. Tell us kind of the excitement that is within this program, obviously coming off what was a historic year last year, the men win the, the NCAA title and the women finished third overall in, in Virginia. Yeah, it was, a, it, was a, it was obviously a great year. Um, I think not only in cross country, but it kind of continued into indoor and outdoor track. And we had one of our, one of, if not the best um, years in our program's history. So, you know, that was, um, was awfully exciting. Um, but like I tell my team, we've got to move past that and get on to what comes next. And so, you know, here we are in 2024 trying to get after it and we're trying to approach it like we're starting square one. And um, yeah, that's where we are. So you see something like that in the preseason polls. Obviously it's it's congratulating guys on what you did last year, but also it tells us everybody is back, it seems like, from last year's team. What can you tell us about this year's group and who is back for this year's team? Well, on the men's side, we return everybody except for Alex Mayer. So the whole the whole crew is back and um, ready to go. And I think we're in a really good position on the men. On the women's side, um, we lost a bunch. We, you know, Taylor Rowe, uh, Gabby Galvedita, Gabby Henteman, Molly Bourne, uh, Steffi Moss, uh, Heidi Demio, either for one reason or another, um, aren't competing this year or aren't here. And so, um, yeah, it's kind of a rebuilding year. But I like where we are. I think the women in the first couple weeks of the season look really good. What can we expect from the incoming class that you have brought in this year? Um, on the men's side, they're going to be probably redshirting. So we won't see a lot, mm -hmm. but we had a big group of guys who brought in last year that redshirted who are starting to get, you know, make um, strides towards contributing. And I hope to see one or two of those guys start to break through this year and then maybe three or four more come through next year. On the women's side, um, I think we'll have some women that might contribute right away. Um, Autumn Mikalski, who's coming from Wisconsin, um, looks really, really good to me. I think we're excited about her, um, maybe even better than we thought she might be when we started this process with her. So excited for her. Uh, same with Gentry uh, from Oklahoma. She's um, similar situation, kind of, um, you know, already seems to be exceeding expectations and then um, how to transfer to. So we'll be okay on the women's side. I just look at to see what, where the Cowboys and the Cowgirls are at this week. I know probably not everybody from the varsity is racing uh, on the Oklahoma state cross country course. Uh, but what can we expect this weekend? I mean, it's a nice test to see where you guys are at, but also, I mean, you get the Arkansas men coming over, you got Texas A&M, Oklahoma, Tulsa, like it's, it's a solid meet. We can see. Yeah, it is. And, you know, it'll be a mixed bag on who does what with their teams. Um, you know, we won't be running a lot of our um, higher end athletes won't be running. So um, I think the other programs may do some of the same thing. I think Arkansas might bring a, a little deeper squad on the men's side than we were. I talked to Coach Buckton a little bit. And he wants to get his guys out and see where they are and do a little do a little work. So I think they're going to do the race and some stuff in addition to it on the course. Uh, so we may see a, a deeper lineup from them. Um, I'm not sure what everybody else is planning, but um, we're going to see a lot of young guys. And on the women's side, what can we expect from them? Um, same sort of thing. We're going to, we'll probably um, run women who are in our five to 15 range on our, what we, what our, we think our lineup is right now. And then um, kind of hold the, the ones we might contribute later in the year, hold them for later. So when you're coming off a year like last year, like it seems like there, there's two different sides of stories. Obviously, the men with so many, much, so much talent back. Women, it's a rebuilding process. What's the message, I guess, for both sides of the program to kind of get ready and, like you said, move forward on into the 2024 year? Well, for both sides, we got to let last year be last year, and, and you know, every every year it's a new chapter. You got to write the new chapter, and you got to kind of let that what happened in the past go and good or bad, get over it, move on to the next next thing. And that's the way we're approaching, you know, this year um, for both men and women. Um, it's easy to get caught up maybe in the hangover. I tell the guys, the hardest, it's hard to win a championship. It's really hard to repeat. 
And so we've talked yeah. about, you know, kind of what NAU did over the last six or seven years and how remarkable that was. And I think if you haven't done that, if you haven't been there and tried to repeat, you don't understand how hard that is to do that year after year. And so, you know, kind of trying to talk about that. We've done it in the past. In the 2009 to 2012 years, we were we were doing kind of the same thing. It was really, really hard. Um, you know, 2010, I think we won by 120 points and we returned our entire roster. And then Shadrach Kipchurch here, who just finished in the late, in the high 20s in Nationals, transferred in. So we had what seemed like an unbeatable team. It, it was hard to imagine a way we could lose. And Wisconsin found a way to beat us by 50 points. So, um, you know, it, it's hard to repeat. Certainly is. And obviously, like everyone thought, like with NAU last year, just with the depth and talent, kind of in the same scenario with you guys that, that year, it's like, this team is so good. We don't know who's going to be. But everyone stepped up big time in, in Virginia. And a lot of your underclassmen did. Who who do you think really, of all those guys there within that top 15, really stepped up their game when it mattered most? Well, I, I think that our entire top seven that we ran at Nationals ran the best races of the season and maybe the best race of their career. Alex Mayer, maybe not. He, he was dealing with some injuries. He missed a huge chunk of the early season. I know he started really training in kind of late September, early October. So he was playing catch up and he was a little behind. But as far as the year went, I mean, he won. He, he was second at the conference meet, which was really good. But I thought his performance at Nationals was probably better than that. And the rest of the guys, it was unquestionable to me that their best day was the national championships. And um, I think we've actually done that two years in a row, which it's hard to do. It takes a little mm -hmm. bit of luck. I think a lot of... Um, discipline and control by the athletes throughout the season to kind of keep themselves under control when maybe the pressure starts to build, the excitement starts to mount, not get carried away. Um, but I think we've done a really good job of it the last two years. And, um, you know, if we want to win this year, we've got to, we got to do it again. We've got to have everybody step up. So who look, who did the most? Well, you know, I can argue for uh, Dennis Kimnitich. He was four, he was 14th at our conference and fourth at nationals. Victor Shitsama was 45th in our conference and, 12th, I think, in Nationals. Um, Fawad was 6th or 7th in the conference and 10th and at Nationals. Um, you know, all those guys did well. Will Muirhead finishing 80th was his highest finish ever at the National Championship. So, you know, honestly, a lot of those guys did well. Adisu, we kind of pulled him out of redshirt at the last moment, ran him at the regional, uh, the conference regional of Nationals after we'd planned on redshirting him. And he had a tough day at the uh, conference meet and then ran really well at conference and then back that up with a 50th place finish at nationals. He was in the mid thirties with a K or two to go and he faded a little bit down the home stretch, just being new to it. But um, all those guys ran really, really well. I mean, obviously, like you said, like it was, it was peaking at the right time of the year. So it, like going back to your point about, you, you know, you pulled the red shirt, like was that kind of a last minute decision or was that because there was maybe somebody in the program that was, that was hurt and you had to get this guy out of his red shirt. No, it was it was not due to injury. It was um, just seeing him come along in, in workouts and starting to develop. And you could see he was starting to hit that exponential uh, growth part of his development for the season where he was struggling, struggling, struggling. All of a sudden, he's improving really quickly. And so just played a hunch and kind of pulled his red shirt, ran him in uniform at the conference meet. And I thought, oof, maybe that was a mistake. And then I ran him at the regional, assuming he wouldn't run at nationals. I thought... We redshirted, we, we, we didn't redshirt, we held a couple of guys out of the region. I thought we may use, we'll give those guys a rest, bring them back in at Nationals. Um, Victor Shitsam was one of them. And then Adisu ran so well at the region, I thought, well, how can I not run him? So we ended up running him, I think he did a great job. And yeah, result, obviously, a nice little 23 or 22 point win over Northern Arizona. Now for the women, I mean, third place overall and arguably what was, it was really North Carolina State versus NAU, a duel basically. But like you, you guys held your own. You managed to uh, do really well, finishing in the top three. What did you really see from your women at that meet, uh, just to put themselves in a position like that? Well, I think the women we were one, we were within an eyelash of winning it. We were thirty points off the win, and we the women. Some of them had their best day at the national championships. Some of them didn't. I thought Bila was great. Uh, Molly Bourne was really good. Gabia was good. Um, Caden Dawson had a great day. Taylor Rowe, who was, has been our, was our rock and the one we could rely on at all times, she did not have her best day. She won the conference meet. I think she was third in the 30s at nationals. 
Um, you know, she'd had three top 15 finishes prior to that. So it was a tough day for her. Had she won it, it doesn't change our position. We still finished third. But had she won it, we just get a little bit here or there. We're right in the conversation. You know, so you know, I look at it and think, well, it was an opportunity lost, but so so does everybody who doesn't win. I'm, I'm sure Mike Smith at, at Northern Arizona feels that much more than I do, and, and rightfully so. But we all we all feel that, you know, every year you think, man, if only, if only, if only. And all of us coaches get together afterwards. We say, man, my team, if only, we've all got some story about if only. So um, I thought our women, um, honestly, it was, a, it was a surprise. We went in, you know, without Gabby Henteman and relying on some people that we hadn't really relied on before without Steffi Moss, who would, you know, had done well for us the year before finishing in the 90s. And so we thought, well, this, this might not be the year. Molly got hurt in the middle of the season. She missed the first three weeks of October in training. She was out and she was playing comeback, but she is 21st and had her second best national finish ever. So, you know, we had some, some really good luck. We had some things go well and kind of maximized. And it's always easy to look at it and think, man, we're, we could have done it. But you rarely look backwards and think we could have done it. We could also have been back there 10 places too. Had Molly not had the day she had, or had Gabby Galvedita, an 800 meter runner, not been 48. You know, we could have very easily fell backwards. So um, it's easy to look ahead of you and say, this is where we could have been. You never think, well, yeah, we also could have been 13th if, if one thing goes wrong, the other one. So it was a good year. Um, it's fun this year, I think, for my women's team. We are starting over. We don't know what our lineup is. We don't know what it's going to look like. We don't have um, – I don't even have – I have a wide range. I think in our women, maybe we could be fifth. Maybe we could be 25th. Maybe we don't qualify. It's hard to know. It's a bunch of unknowns. And um, as stressful as that might be, it's also exciting and fun as a coach to think, mm -hmm. okay, how are we going to do this? How are we going to make up for the loss of um, uh, four All-Americans? And we've got another one who's um, going to miss the season for for a medical uh, – for an injury situation. So we're we're going with a whole new lineup, and um, it's fun to, it's fun to kind of try to put those puzzle pieces together. So obviously, you're, you're approaching both teams totally different. Obviously, like, the men's team has what they have. The women's team, it's kind of up in the air. Like, like you said, it's, it's pretty fun as a coach to kind of deal with that. When was the last time you really had to deal with something like that before? Um, you know, it wasn't too long ago. Five, six years ago, um, man, we were, we were having a I – I tell our team this. It's fun right now. We're kind of riding away. We've been third, third, second, first. The men have over the last um, several years. The women have been 13th, 4th, 3rd. So we're riding this wave. And good programs, every once in a while, catch a wave where they become great programs. But it's really hard to maintain. And eventually that wave breaks. And you got to sit and wait for the next one to come around. And you do everything you can to kind of speed the, speed the process. But sometimes it takes time. And the men, we rode a similar type of wave from 2007 to 2013 where, you know, I honestly felt like, man, if we don't get a trophy, in any given year, it's going to be a miserable failure. And, you know, I got humbled by that thought, you know, four or five years later, I was like, man, I wish we'd get in the top 10 again. And so, um, you know, it was just 2019, our men's team didn't qualify. And uh, the first time in my career, we didn't qualify. And so we've been here, but we've been where the women are before where we're trying to figure it out. And we've been where the men are, where we're trying to um, kind of defend and, and maintain that edge and, and, and stay focused. I think one trap that we can fall into is you look around or athletes look around they think man we've got all these guys coming back we've added a couple of pieces we've got kids coming out of red shirt we've got so much depth that i don't have to be great this year if i'm pretty good and everybody else is pretty good we're gonna be okay and i think that's what happened to us in 2011 when everybody decided hey, we can be pretty good and we'll get there including probably me you know it probably starts with a coach and maybe my subconscious attitude or whatever that kind of gets um imparted onto the team and we kind of woke up in the middle of the season that, oh, crud, Wisconsin's really good and, and ended up winning. So we're, we've been through that. We've learned our lessons. And I've told them, hey, look, we have got to approach this year like we're the underdogs. Don't believe the hype. Don't believe the rankings. Don't believe any of that. There are, I can think of five teams that I would give equal chances to win the title to us. And so, um, you know, we're one of five. And then there's probably another four or five that have smaller chances, but chances. So it's a, it's a big pie. You know, if you look at the, the, the odds pie, it's a big pie divided up in, into different segments. And we've got a piece of it, but it's only a piece. It's not, it's not a majority. 
really Friday is kind of like let's see what the women are kind of made. Even though you're only not you're not maybe racing the top five, mm-hmm. but it's kind of like all right, let's see where my six, seven, eight, nine are at. Is that a, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I think also with the men, we've got all those young guys that we registered last year that we were kind of um, you know, some of them, Aiden Grenados ended up running three forty and fourteen oh four, I think, last year. Um, so he started to develop pretty well by the end of the spring. A couple of others were in the 346, 347 ranges, young guys who made big improvements out of high school. That progress has hopefully continued. And I'm hoping we see a couple surprises. Now, the way we do it, it's a 5K race, but we mm-hmm. don't want to miss. This is also the weekends are our kind of big aerobic week, uh, periods of the week. And so we don't want to miss that time. So we will do some work before the race as part of an extended warm up that will get, um, you know, some pretty good intensity in it before we go and run the race. So we'll get to see not only what can they do over this 5K, but what can they do in the 5K when they've got some running in their legs prior. Particular men we should pay, or male athlete, female athlete we should pay attention for for this week? On the men, I'm uh, I'm really excited to see where Jacob Deacon, Aiden Grenados, Hamish Hart, um, uh, Ben, uh, sorry, Matt Thomas, those four young guys, Ian Kame, um, I think those guys, Jerry Mendez, to a lesser extent, he's he's been a little dinged up, but he ran well in the spring. I really want to see if, again, what they did in the spring has continued over the summer, and they're um, even better now than they were in the, in the in the spring. And for the women, on the women. Um, it's it's a different scenario. We we didn't have this big group of women that we redshirted, so it's women that have run before. I'm really excited by where both Lauren and Grace Ping are right now, and kind of gave mm-hmm. them the option to race or not race. And Grace Ping, if you know her, if you give her the option to race, she's gonna race. It doesn't matter what it is. So mm-hmm. when I say hey, you can race or sit it out and just kind of train through, she really wanted to go, and I think maybe that um, kind of maybe Lauren already felt that, but as soon as Grace wanted to run, then Lauren wanted to run. So I'm really excited to see where they are. I think they've had a great summer and um, our two women that are obviously very talented, have struggled with some injuries and some uh, kind of development along the way um, that's taken time, but I really like where they are. So excited to see how they do. What does the outlook look like for you guys this year, schedule wise? And you know, when, when can we see that varsity squad racing together for the very first time on both the men and women's side? We will race everybody who is um, not redshirting at the Jamboree on September 28th. And on the men's side, we're racing Texas, New Mexico, uh, Oregon, um, and then several others. Those stand out in my mind. If people, coaches I've talked to, they're coming. On the women's side, I think New Mexico's coming. I'm not sure that Texas or Oregon are bringing their women's team. So um, I think SMU is coming that weekend. So we'll get a little bit of... Um, an idea, but the even bigger, we know what times mean on this course. Now it's been, uh, six, this will be six years of running on it. So we've got a lot of data. We kind of figured out what is predictive and what, um, early season teams might mean. And even in different weather conditions, we're starting to kind of figure that out. It took a while because the course is different from what we had, you know, um, prior to the, the remodeling of our course. The big change this year, obviously, is the Big 12. I mean, you're basically bringing in, it seems like, half the mountain region yeah. <laughs> into the Big 12 conference with, with Utah, BYU, Colorado coming back now. I mean, it's kind of like a full circle moment with Colorado coming back. It's yeah. Oklahoma State versus Colorado. Like, that's the big rivalry, again, in the Big 12. Are, is everybody excited about this big change? Obviously, like, the realignment thing is is with because of football. But really, I mean, it, it shapes up the Big 12 as a really good cross-country conference. Yeah, I'm thrilled about it. I mean, last year, the Big 12 and the men went one, three, five, seven at the national championships. And people missed that. And we've done this before. The last time Colorado was in the conference, we'd have four in the top 12, five in the top 20 as a conference at the national championship. So the Big 12 has traditionally been a very strong conference. It gets lost in kind of the discussion sometimes, I think. But it, it, I think the conference is often underrated. This year, I think that I mentioned some teams that I think have a chance to challenge for a title. I think Iowa State and BYU are two of those, and they're in our conference. And um, I haven't even gotten to talking about Colorado yet. Um, I think Texas Tech has a, a pretty deep revamped lineup this week, this year. They could be a very good team. Um, 
yeah, on the women's side, you get the same teams um, plus Utah. West Virginia is very good uh, on the women's side. They don't have a men's team, but the women's conference is also very deep. I think BYU is probably the class of our conference um, right now going into the season. I think they have um, a great veteran lineup and a great coach who will get the most out of those young athletes that anybody will get other athletes. So they're probably the favorites, I would say, but I think it's close. I think, you know, again, West Virginia, Utah, uh, maybe Colorado, um, Oklahoma State, all our teams that could convince, uh, contend for a conference title. And BYU, I, I think on the right day, can contend for a national title. Correct me if I'm wrong. This is your 19th year at Oklahoma State? This is my 23rd year here. My 19th year as the head men's coach. As the, uh, yeah, so 23rd year. Is this the deepest the Big 12 has really ever been, at least what you've seen? You know, back in the day, I think one year, Colorado won, Texas was seventh, we were eighth, um, Kansas was 12th, and maybe Texas A&M was 20th. We've had years and, and periods of time like this before. This is certainly a, a deep conference, and it's hard to say where it'll shake out. I mean, last year going one three five seven, that was probably the best you know, having your fourth team in the conference finish seventh, I, that, that is the best that I can remember the Big 12 ever being for sure. But we lose Texas. So we replace Texas mm -hmm. with Colorado on the cross country side. And it, it seems like, at least in the grand scheme of things, that'll be an even trade. Maybe not right now. I think right now Texas might have a leg up. They, they were awfully good last year. And we had Greg Metcalf down there did a, did a phenomenal job with that group of guys. And, you know, I think kind of shocked everybody but people in Austin when they came away with the, with the seventh place finish. For both the men and women, is there is there a theme that you guys have this year? Does it change every season? Like, what what's your guys' message going into this year? Yeah, sometimes there are there is, and it usually takes a while. I I kind of get the feel of the season, the feel of the team, and then something pops in my head one night. I start saying it, repeating it over and over again. Um, one of our assistant coaches, Mason Harbor, has he's got a a, a a phrase he's saying to the women, and it's starting to catch. I think a little bit and. Um, I'm not going to repeat it because I'm going to leave that to the women's team to repeat, but they've got a, mm -hmm. they've got something they're kind of saying it's starting to take over the, 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 the kind of the, the ethos of our team and the way we're approaching things, but I'll leave that for the women to reveal if they want to do that or not. I hear it at practice a lot now. So yeah, on the men, we haven't really got there. I, there's nothing that stood out, you know, um, you know, one year notoriously, I, I, we were facing a team in our conference that um, was very well coached and very um, disciplined in their approach in races and training and everything was very planned and they stuck to the plan and they're always very good at it. And um, their, their races were always really well schemed. And um, I just, we had the, um, we used the old Mike Tyson um, phrase that everybody has a plan until you get punched in the mouth. And so that was our, 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 our phrase that year. And that was the first year, we ended up winning, coming back and winning a Big 12 title after not winning for three years. So we'd won 10 in a row and then we lost three in a row. And the start of this most recent four in a row was that year. And so there is things that kind of come to us along the way that we somehow get said and then gets repeated. And all of a sudden it's this kind of motto, but we don't, I don't sit around and think, oh, what's the motto for the year? I want to plan something out. It just kind of happens organically or it doesn't. Sure, it does. So. Dave, well, I really appreciate your time, man. Wish you nothing but the best this year for both the, the men and women's team. Of course, the Oklahoma State Cowboy preview goes on this Friday from Stillwater, Oklahoma. Dave, uh, like I said, wish you nothing but the best this year and good luck this season. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it.